Today's video is Schluck. All right, welcome back to the month of Ape Rill. Today, we could be talking about Mighty Joe Young. I mean, this is a great classic ape movie, but nah. Today, we're talking Schlock. Now, Schlock was the first film to be directed by 21-year-old John Landis, who did right. Animal House, Blues Brothers, American Werewolf in London. Um, he's like one of the comedy giants of film. Yeah, I think Coming to America is probably my favorite of his. I mean, this has got to be his worst film by far. <sighs> Yo, oh, does he have a worse one? No, I think it, I think this movie is great. It's the first time I ever saw it. I consider it the ultimate B-movie because it's a B-movie making fun of other B-movies of other generations. That's true because for one thing, um, he, he was 21 years old when he made this, his first movie. You got to start somewhere. He even says in, in uh, his book, um, which I have right here, uh, John Landis, Monsters in the Movies, which I'll bring up again at some point. He even says in there that he wishes the movie could have like a disclaimer in the beginning that says, hey, I'm a you know, 21 year old filmmaker with you know, X amount of dollars. Please uh, cut me a break. <laughs> yeah. But, and also it's called Schlock. So if you're gonna watch a movie called Schlock, hopefully you weren't expecting grade A material. I mean, when the movie opens up, it, it, it lists other good movies and shows like war footage up and then says, and then there's schlock, which is this piece of crap you're about to watch. And I don't know if the term schlock has really aged well. Like, I don't know if a lot of younger people know what the term is, but it just means like a really, really crappy, just thrown out there, make it to make it. Like Roger Corman makes schlock. Um, uh, most trauma movies are schlock, no offense. Uh, uh, we make schlock, so, you know, it's fun. But uh, this movie does have some really weird stuff in it. Like, the first 15 minutes is actually very hard to sit through, I think, because it's like, it opens with, it's just slow. It's like, it starts off with a bunch of dead bodies, and they're like, oh, there's these uh, banana murderers that we're investigating, and there's these detectives who are just talking about it. And um, I mean, it's a little funny. Like one of them has no encouraging words. He's just like, yep, there, more people are gonna die. There's nothing we can do about it. And it just says everything like really negative. It's, it's really cold. I don't know if it was supposed to be like, uh, like a reference to just the media at the time or just those movies, how there's so many pauses, like a lot of 50s monster movies and 60s monster movies. And um, when you see the police, like even when you do like plan nine and stuff, the cops are always just standing around talking to each other for no reason. So maybe they're trying to do that or maybe it's just to stretch out the runtime to be feature length. But I thought it was funny, especially the one um, Detective Sergeant Wino. Uh, with who has the hair and has like a Woody Allen look to him. He's pretty funny the entire movie. I don't know. Can you tell us anything? Give us one ray of hope that our streets will soon be safe to walk again. No. Well, uh, surely you have some sort of lead, some hunch you're following? We haven't a clue. And I would say this thing is going to get a lot worse before it gets better. Uh, it basically, it takes a long time before the ape gets into it. So you're kind of stuck with all these weird, like, weird, odd kind of humor where you don't know if you're supposed to laugh or what. Um, and just to kind of run through some of the weird moments, there's like, um, there's this scientist with a pipe on his head. I mean, what what is the deal with that? Then, then about 28 minutes in, there's a shot of the police station sign. And you remember that the C drops off of the sign, but it's like a weird sort of like, like effect where today it would be like a Photoshop effect. I mean, I don't know how they did it then, but. It feels almost like a precursor to a lot of the Pat Proft or um, like a, a lot of like, like the Naked Gun movies or Airplane, which came out, what, seven years after this? There's a lot of parody type comedy scenes that don't play with the rest of the monster film that well. It's like they shot everything separately, which happens a lot. There's a lot, this movie is filled with reoccurring jokes. Um, including Max, or sorry, ugh, including John Landis's um, "See You Next Wednesday," which he, you know, which is like his fake movie that he puts in a ton of other movies where it's always different. Uh, but you probably know more about that. Yeah, uh, "See You Next Wednesday" is the non-existent movie where um, it, it's it's basically like he just yeah, like you said, he puts it all over his movies, 
and like the reporters mention it. Um, uh, and every time when they're talking about it, they always mention other big A-list stars. So like everybody ever is in this movie. Yeah, or yeah, or it's like a different movie with the same title. That's other stars, and you keep seeing different posters of it. Where sometimes it's the Blob meets Dinosaur movie. Sometimes it's a space movie. Sometimes I know they mention it in like coming to american like a ton of like american werewolf in london has it in there like there's a ton of movies that reference it there's it's like a western yeah like they're always you don't you never know what is this movie like what kind of genre is it? yeah i know it comes from 2001 the uh, space odyssey see you next wednesday and speaking of uh, 2001, like, there's so many references to that movie in this with, you know, like him throwing the uh, the bone through the banana store, the, the same music, which plays 40 times in the movie, like... The, you know, you've seen lots of movies use the theme that's in 2001. I mean, I know it's, a, it's like a classical composition. I don't remember the original title, but it's I, I was called the 2001 theme. Whenever they they play that in a movie usually it's it's just it, it's kind of shortened if anything this movie plays the entire thing and then it runs out and they loop it a second time which it, it, it's like when a uh, rick flair comes in for an entrance and wrestling he plays the same song oh does he loop it yeah well yeah i mean they just keep playing it and like you know which i think totally defeats that the the whole purpose that's that theme because it builds up to that big like crescendo at the end but then when it has to do it all over again it, it just takes all the 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 wind out of it the the scene where the the ape is eating cake with the two little girls like like it's just the choices the weird weird jokes that i don't know if they're funny i, I don't know there there's a lot of weird scenes in this movie that happen for no reason and sometimes Schlock, you feel Schlock is the name of the the ape, by the way, the missing link, and I don't know why. And think they call him Schlock the Puss at one point too. Like, it, it's very strange. So I guess he is an ape. It's John Landis in the suit, by the way. Yeah. Um, uh, which just show the picture, like just to imagine him directing while wearing an ape suit is yeah. pretty funny. And he's, he's also he's 21 years old. Like he spent his life savings on this movie. Um, or, well, I mean, he was pretty rich, so it's probably fine. Uh, well, I mean, back then. Yeah, it was like, I think it was like 60K in the movie, which he saved up. But he worked on other films before, but this is his first directing movie. But uh, I don't know what 60K then is now, but it's probably a lot, like a few hundred thousand dollars. I mean, it's a lot for one person like that to, to raise. But, I mean, with movie budgets, it, it's not a lot. So this was... Yeah, definitely to, to reinforce, this is a very low-budget movie. Yeah, so the ape suit was designed by Rick Baker. That was one of his first um, uh, movies, and he, you know, developed a you know friendship, a relationship with uh, John Landis, uh, like a working relationship. Um, Kong '76, he did. He did American Werewolf in London, The Howling, Harry and the Hendersons. I mean, Rick Baker was like the modern ape guy. Like, if there's ever an ape suit. And an, and an actor, a lot of times you play him too. So, and I always like because, um, and they do a really good job with the eyes and the face, especially because yeah. Schlock is the only person that routinely looks at the camera, like constantly, like almost every scene. He's always just like, 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 like this is a joke, clearly, and he does it constantly through the movie. Yeah, the the ape suit is actually really good. Um, it's by far the best part of the whole movie um, because there's it's not just a suit. There's also like like some kind of way like prosthetics like it attaches to the face somehow where you can still see his real eyes and the the expressions he makes like sometimes he smiles sometimes he looks a little sad there's even like one part where he like cries and there's this scene um yeah 38 minutes seven seconds there's this really funny smile he does i mean just look at that face and then there's a scene with the piano where he's just like making those weird Faces. Yeah, Schlock keeps coming upon people that are blind, either because they're they had surgery or it's like a blind uh, pianist who thinks he's just some guy, and they play the piano together and stuff like that. So there's a lot of jokes that repeat in the movie, but you're like, okay, we'll just do that again. But the song they play is actually really good, and and it's like mirrored what there's like a school play going on because you're following all these different people in the movie, from parents to kids to newscasters. Um, to the police, to the citizens of the town, to Schlock himself, um, going through this this whole thing of Schlock attacking the town, very much like movies like The Blob, which we've covered before, which they show in this film. They show the projector attack. So like it, it's it's a it's a B movie 
reviewing other so, so you're watching a movie where they're watching a movie about people watching a movie about a monster that's attacking the theater that's also attacking the theater that's in the theater watching it at the same time. Detective wears a fake ape mask in one scene just to kind of remind you of what a fake ape mask would look like and it looks so much worse so it's like it it kind of puts it in a perspective how good the effects were on the the ape. Yeah, it's all, most scenes, are, like, the first time you see uh, the ape is in the daytime, it just walks by. Um, I, no, sorry, sorry, it, it's, in, it's in the cave. That's where you see it first in the dark. And there's so many funny repeating jokes where, like, the kids keep walking over and getting thrashed and killed horribly. Um, they, they remind me of the kids from Earthbound for some reason. One of the striped shirts are just, like, on an adventure. And they're in this cave, and one gets brutally murdered, and the other guy's like, hey, are you okay? Billy, are you all right? This time we better go to the police. Wrong. I'm gonna go see what's the matter. Um, excuse me, have you seen... Yeah, the rest of the movie, Schlock is in the, uh, the daylight and just walks around kind of like the Bigfoot Zapruder, Zapruder film, like that's JFK assassination. Whatever they call the Bigfoot video, it reminds me of that when he's walking around. But the ape's behavior, I want to talk about how weird just the ape in general is, the character itself, is they never clarify why it kills people. It's just randomly going around just flat out murdering. And like even murders like children. I mean, I don't think they show any of that, but it's like... Well, he never, you never see him kill a kid. He's usually very nice to kids, like, um, like he's feeding them some of the cake. Uh, yeah, but in the beginning, like on the playground, then you see all the bodies and stuff. Like, well, there are a few dead kids there, but you know, you don't know how they died. But but you never see Schlock kill a kid on screen. Usually, when he, like there's a kid where they're they're playing baseball in like a dirt mound, because um, everything's shot around. It reminds me of um, Poltergeist when they were just building tons and tons of uh, communities in uh, California at the time, like uh, suburbs around LA, because this was probably shot like Palo Alto or something like that out there. And they uh, uh, they're just playing in one of the dirt lots, and Schlock comes up and then eventually takes a kid. Like they're doing um, raspberries back and forth, much like in Dunstan checks in. Uh, he picks a kid up and throws him, but then the kid lands in a pool. So they they, they, they they never show the kids get hurt, but they show the humans just get murdered. Oh, yeah, the Frankenstein reference. Yeah, like there's that, and there's also the blind person. So it's like there's they're always referencing Frankenstein, and, and you know, the Frankenstein monster is this misunderstood character where he doesn't mean to cause any harm. The ape, they could have easily played it that way, where the ape isn't doing this on purpose, and is just kind of like, you know, curious and... You know, just misunderstood. They but they never but give they, Schlock real motivation. He just does things. Oh, and I guess he I just say. murders. I mean, the, the ape is a flat out murderer in this. Like, he just goes around killing people, but then he sort of has a character change. He just randomly just kind of decides what he does in the moment. Like, it, he doesn't have any. Because there's the scene where he's like feeding the ducks with the little girl. Um, so he's friendly there. But then other times he's like barging into somebody's house, like smashing their door in to murder them. Well, I will say he does murder teenagers, but he doesn't murder any children. Like, and then he hits somebody with a pillow, and then next thing he's sniffing some flowers. This ape is so unpredictable that I think that might be the funniest joke in the movie, oh. is that this ape makes no sense. I also love whenever he finds a gun, he picks it up and tries to eat it every single time. He like just puts it in his mouth and walks away. Oh, you, you brought up the scene earlier with the ducks. Which is ironic because I, I, the only way to watch this movie, especially in HD, is it was on some platform called Tubi or Tubby. I forgot what it's called. And oh, I, yeah. I, I casted it from my phone and it kept playing ads every like five minutes. It was kind of annoying, actually. Like ads are fine, but it kept playing like every five minutes of the film. And it was the same ad. It was this dish soap commercial where they're like washing oil off of ducks and saying how good the dish soap is. So when oh. the duck scene came up, I was already like, I already had PTSD about these ducks getting washed. Oh. I don't know why they kept showing the damn ad, but I'm sick of Tubi, so I'm, I'm, I'm never using Tubi again. Kind of reminds me of Blip. Remember Blip? Metro PCS, with that same Metro PCS ad on like every video. Yeah, it's kind of like, I guess when, you know, I don't know too much about online advertising except for YouTube stuff, but I guess if you don't have an ad inventory, you just keep playing the same ads over and over. Kind of on the radio, sometimes you'll hear the same ad twice accidentally, I guess because a lot of it's automated, but this just kept playing the same goddamn washing little ducks ads. And I was like, all right. Like we always have a, a looks like Kieran moment in every movie. Um, do you know who I'm oh, talking about? Is it the guy at the banana store? 
It's a, a guy wearing a hard hat, like a construction worker guy. Oh, right. He's in like a pit with another guy. Yeah, and they both get killed, of course. Yeah. Turned to the side, but he's got the same hair and the beard. So that that's Kieran in Schlock. The people who made this movie were obviously spoofing B-movies, but also paying tribute to the classic monsters of the past. In the 60s, a lot of people were growing up on famous monsters of Filmland magazines and uh, chiller theater on TV. Like they'd be rerunning a lot of the uh, the old uh, monster movies from Universal that they didn't play ever since they were in the theaters. They would start putting them on TV for the first time. So a lot of people were, were getting into that stuff now. Um, and you mentioned the scene where they're watching the blob. They, boy, do they watch the blob because they. It, it's like the whole movie. Yeah. It's not like in Greece. You know, in Greece, when they show like one clip of the blob real quick. Yeah. In Schlock, they show like an entire scene of the blob. And the whole movie just takes a stop. Uh, the ape is in the theater eating the popcorn, and everybody's just watching the movie. And the guy sitting next to the ape was Forey Ackerman, who was the creator of Famous Monsters in Filmland. Oh. He's kind of like the first big movie fan, the first big monster fan. Like, he was the biggest collector for a long time. Uh, so he was kind of like the like our biggest curator of all these movies back then. So John Lannis was among this generation uh, that, that were huge fans of the classic monsters. Um, and that man who's sitting right next to him was his gateway into those movies. Um, so all these little references, you can tell this was made by fans with love, even though the movie itself is so weird. It wasn't just a monster fan generation. It was also an ape generation where um, I mean, apes, ape movies are still popular now. You know, we just talked about Dunstan checks in with all the different bad modern ape movies. Yeah, and there's King Kong versus Godzilla comes out this year, I th maybe, I oh, think. Yeah, maybe. But, we'll but there was like, uh, there was a fascination with people in ape suits back then. Yeah. So this was kind of coming on the end of all that, where anybody who had a really good ape suit could get into acting and be and be the ape in a lot of them. I mean, of course, there they were also a lot of trained stunt people, but there was this, um, this main guy, uh, Ray Crash Corrigan, his nickname was Crash. He was in Tarzan the Ape Man, the ape, the hairy ape, monster in the ape, the white gorilla, killer ape, Bela Lugosi meets a Brooklyn gorilla. Like this was the ape guy, and it was probably the same suit that was in all these movies. And now it's all digital, and you just have Andy Serkis or Doug Jones hop in something, and then you're ready to go. Like that's all you get to pick. Pick yeah, one. Yeah. You want short or tall? Like Ray Crash Corgan was like the 30s, 40s, and 50s. But then you had Bob Burns, who was like probably like the second biggest collector after Forey Ackerman. Um, he uh, I mean, he even has the original Kong model, uh, the original armature, um, or w one of the existing ones. He got an ape costume, and he named his own ape uh, Kogar, and he was in uh, Superman versus the Gorilla Gang. He was in The Ghostbusters in 75, who he played... Right. Yeah. Yeah, he played Tracy the Gorilla. Yeah, I, I remember the uh, cartoon show based on that, but yeah, I didn't watch too much of the actual show. Then you could also go back to all the Three Stooges shorts. There was like at least four Three Stooges episodes that had apes in them, and, it, and I guarantee it must have been the same costume. So the Three Stooges definitely had a thing with apes. And then you had all these King Kong ripoffs, like Mighty Picking Man, Ape, which is the one where the ape gives the middle finger at the helicopter, King Kung Fu. Um, it's just unbelievable how many bad ape movies that there were out there. Um, so it seems like Schlock was definitely meant to imitate those bad ape movies on purpose and to pay tribute to all those gorilla men who played, you know, the same gorilla. Yeah, that's why I say it's the ultimate B movie. But it's, it's also the ultimate ape movie. Yeah. I mean, the movie even ends like King Kong, so it's like... And it also began the Rick Baker era because, you know, Rick Baker did, uh, did the ape costume in this and then he went on to do all those other movies we mentioned. So that kind of brought forth the the next wave of more like quality ape films i guess yeah i don't think it was because of schlock but it was because john landis and rick baker got to get together so i guess it was indirectly so that if if, if any reason that's one reason to watch this film like if you were thinking about it like i definitely would but 
Yeah, so it really does have like a place in history as like in between, like before Planet of the Apes, before all this, you know, all this stuff, but after all the uh, the other bad ape movies. So it was kind of just this marker in history, I like to think of it as. It's funny how many movies show eight, how many eight movies show other eight movies in their eight movies. Like this yeah. one, this one had, um, I think there's a couple King Kong shots and a few other things. Dunstan checks in, had them watching Planet of the Apes in one scene. Um, that seems to be a popular, um, I think yeah. P Planet of the Apes uh, 3, I think they're watching TV and they run, a, they stumble upon an ape movie, if I'm not mistaken. So it, it's interesting. Uh, so w once again, uh, John Landis's book, uh, Monsters in the Movies, uh, great book if you want to uh, check it out, uh, if you're able to get it. It's a... Uh, uh, he goes category by category, so he talks about like vampires and werewolves and everything. And there's a, a chapter all about eight movies, so it, it goes into like all the movies that uh, uh, that he was like referencing. So he's kind of just showing. Like, there's like lots of great screenshots of all these different like old eight movies. Yeah, I think some of the standout scenes for me in this is I love when the professor drives up and it looks like he's a gorilla in the car because they put paper over the window. Uh, and the conversation between him, the scientist, and the and the news guy is pretty funny, uh, especially when he gets lowered into the hole wearing the head, um, which is pretty good. And then they just leave him down there. Uh, we'll talk about him coming back later, the professor. Um, I like the part where the newscaster's arm gets ripped off because they realize they're talk he's talking to the the eight monster, and he just he goes to shake his hand or something, or like he just rips his arm off. Like there's a lot of amazing parody and comedy beats in this movie where something just like he just comes out and attacks someone viciously and then just walks away or eats yeah. some bread or like it, there's so many back and forth. The dialogue's super snappy. Um, but some scenes go on way too long. There's a part where the, the, the girl who's blind thinks, uh, Schlock is a dog and keeps playing fetch with Schlock for like 15 minutes. Like there's a lot the movie theater scene goes on for like 30 minutes. Um, I think this thing could probably be a, a, a cut down, maybe a 10 minute movie if you wanted to, but I guess that's the point is to make it kind of painfully boring and unfunny at parts, which makes it funnier. So... Yeah, it also ends with um, a f like it's good. There's gonna be a new movie called Son of Schlock, because the the scientist eventually comes out of the hole in the ground where the cave where they found Schlock, and he has a baby with him, and that's supposed to be Son of Schlock. Um, so I don't know if they're ever gonna make that, but if if John Landis is Schlock, maybe Max Landis is Son of Schlock. All right, yep, that was Schlock. Yeah, so next week um, got a Kurt Russell classic, Barefoot Executive. Ooh. Cult classic, I'd say. Yeah, I like Kurt Russell. <laughs>